everyone, my name is Sam. Thanks for checking out this video. <clears throat> if you get to the end and liked it, then subscribe. Bell notification, give the video a thumbs up. I also just high-key totally realized I'm fairly certain I keep wearing this same sweater shirt thing every single day that I film because I generally film on Saturday or Sunday and this shirt is just beyond comfy. So that's when I do laundry and as soon as it's clean, I immediately put it back on. I do you wash my clothes, okay? We are going to do, I was just about to say December wrap up. No, we are doing the January wrap up because I am not gonna do what I did last month and get to like January 30th and be like, I will finally wrap up December. No, that's bullshit. Um, so yeah, these are the books that I managed to read in December. I didn't read as many as I normally do, but I was so busy with work and drained and tired and was sick for a little bit of it. So I was like, I'm quite happy with what I did get done. And I think I got all of my TBR except for one book done. And it was the one book that didn't have an audiobook. So when my eyes were dry or puffy and all that shit, I couldn't sit down and read when my nose was drooling and all that shit. So it's gone on my pile over on my shelf here. And at the end of the year, if I don't pick up any of those books, they get unhauled. That's my rule. Because let's be real, I'm just not going to read them at that point. So... So starting off, I actually started reading this book in, I think it was December 29th, or no, it probably would have been December 30th. I started reading it when I was coming back home here to Alberta, um, and so I think it took me a couple days, but I read The Goblin Emperor because by Catherine Addison. I read something by her, The Angel of the Crows, I want to say, last year and enjoyed it. I know it doesn't have great ratings on Goodreads, well last I checked, but I actually really enjoyed it. And I've heard nothing but just like utter like cultish praise about The Goblin Emperor. And then I saw that they released the cover for, it's a standalone, but they're like, I think switch Watching POVs staying in the same world or something like that. They're standalones, but they're like within the same series, you know what I mean? Um, but they're not companions, I think, from what it sounds like. Anyways, I was like, you know what, maybe I should finally get my shit together. And they had the audiobook on it of The Goblin Emperor on script. So while I was on my plane, I listened to the audiobook and loved it. It's so good. It's such a good book. Such a good book. Oh my gosh. Loved this book so much. Um, it's just like very like fantasy politics but like not super complicated but also like not boring i don't totally know how to explain it so i'm definitely like even more curious to read the next book that they have coming out and i think the fact that like people have been waiting like i think it's like four years or something like that for this new book to come out and everyone's like yes yes like people haven't forgotten about it i think that's a really really good sign so i'm definitely going to keep my eye out for that book and this was an amazing read. It was a solid five out of five stars. Then I read Secondhand Curses. This was, I think my audio backlog read of the month. I bought it on sale cause my friend, I think, yeah, I think it was Emily, read it and was like, oh, it was fun. And I was like, cool. And then I read the summary. I was like, this sounds a little bit like Shrek actually in like kind of a Robin Hoodie way. And that's definitely what it was. Um, it's like a concoction of like multiple stories kind of tied together um, that I honestly, while I was reading through it, didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, they're probably just like not related and there's going to be a something at the end to tie the group that's been doing this together. No, they're actually all very much <laughs> related. Um, it was fun. It was an interesting. It was like, there was a lot of like times where I kind of chuckled. So it was a very fun, light fantasy um, that definitely has like an adult fantasy, but touches of Shrek with like a bit of Robin Hood-esque. Um, and... Yeah, it was just a fun, lighthearted read. You follow these, like, people from all these different walks of life, and they're solving problems uh, through this, like, fairy tale enchanted world. And it starts off with Cinderella, and um, it ends with finding out the the lineage of one of the characters and all that stuff. So it was really fun. I think it was, like, a three and a half or four out of five stars for me. I'm not happy. I'm not. I'm not upset that I read it. I, I'm. I'm. I'm not. Ex I'm not upset that I own the audiobook of it. I just won't buy a physical copy of it. I don't even know if you can buy a physical copy. I think it was an Audible original. But either way, I'm happy I own it. Then I picked up The Bone Shard Daughter by Andrea Stewart. This is the first in. This is the first in. I think it's said to be a duology. I'm not 100 percent sure. They have released the title for the next book. Uh, I think it's The Bone Shard Emperor. I want to say this was such a good book it's wild that this is a debut wild I don't comprehend it loved the characters loved the conflict and the politics of this I feel like this world was super like it just went up like in front of me it was so 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 good there's internal and external conflicts for the main characters to be watching out for and you never really know who to trust in those situations so I 
I loved, loved this read. Like this, I can understand why people were like, oh, it's like the Poppy War. I don't think in the, like the, the plot necessarily it is, but I feel like a lot of elements, I was like, oh, I could see that. Oh, I definitely understand that. Oh, okay, I can see that. And I got like sucked in, I think the way that I did with the Poppy War. So I am definitely going to be picking up book two when it comes out. Um, and I am very happy that I own the pretty end pages. And I think, oh, and a signed edition that I got from um, Goldsboro. So I will watch for Goldsboro. Hopefully they'll do um, the same setup for book two because absolutely worth the like 50 bucks Canadian I pay for shipping and conversion for this. Maybe that's how I should rank books now instead of stars being like, am I happy that I bought it? Am I going to go buy it if it's a library book? Am I happy that I read it and happy that I don't own it? Or was it a total waste of my time? Will that be helpful maybe? Okay, I normally try and do these in like relative order of how I read them or wrote it down at least. But these books keep falling over. So we're gonna do Spell, Sling <laughs> Spell Slinger next. Oh my gosh. So this month I did a reread of the six books in the Spell Slinger series. The Way of the Argozi is coming out in, I think it's April and I have that pre-ordered from Waterstones. I'm so excited for that book. So it will match these cover schemes that I got because these are the UK copies. I hate the US ones. They're so basic and so generic. And they've also pitched it as an adult fantasy in Canada. It's adult fantasy price. It's in the adult fantasy section. This is not even oh, a, a new adult. This is very firmly a YA series. So don't pick it up from the Canadian or US bookstore being like, Oh, an adult fantasy. It is a fucking YA, okay? But anyways, Spellsinger is book one. It was a reread. Number two whoops, is Shadow Black, which was, oh my God, which was another reread. I'm gonna hit my dogs if I throw these on the bed. Uh, book number three was Charmcaster, another reread. Book number four was Soulbinder, which was the last of the rereads. Then book number five was Queenslayer, which was a fresh read for me. And then book number six, Crownbreaker, which was the final book, which was, again, a fresh read format. I have all of these signed because Sebastian de Castell's wife is also a librarian. And so I see him whenever we normally have conferences in the real world. Um, he is normally either at, what's it called? The There's a fantasy bookstore in um, Toronto. I can't remember the name of it. It's not Galaxy Phoenix or something like that. I don't know but he normally does it there and then one year he also went to the conference in the uh, exhibitors hall so I always brought these and got them signed and I have my Trader Blades series by him signed as well um I this series gets better with each book and oh my god Queen Slayer I was panicked for the vast majority of these books because I didn't understand what the fuck was gonna happen um and I kept panicking because of the term Queen Slayer as the title. The titles are always very much like related to the book. You read it and you're like, okay, that is why this book is titled that. So when I got to Queen Slayer, I was panicked because I really fucking liked the queen, okay? Um, she's a child also. So you're like, are we killing children in this? Like, I get that not everyone likes children like myself, but like, I feel like that's a little bit excessive. But Queen Slayer and Crownbreaker was so good such good conclusions everything that happened with the queen as well as our main character with his family drama and his sister i still don't know how i feel about her sister like there's kind of a redemption arc in the end but like she's kind of a raging bitch for the vast majority of this series and like she's super powerful but like hella deluded like i feel like that's just a bad mix so i got to the end i'm like i don't know if that's actually in my brain how i feel like she would react i don't know that those are the actions she would follow through on so i don't I don't know what I'm doing with that, but I am very, very, I was gonna say very more. I'm even more now excited to read The Way of the Argosi. Um, I think it's set in the same world, but just like different POVs and everything. So it just, this is a perfect series. I think the ending was good. I will say that. I think that's one thing I'm like, when I get to the ends of trilogies, especially, I'm like, this is a bad ending. Like we've all read the last book of The Hunger Games. We've all, actually I can't say we've all read the last book of Divergent because I didn't read that series. Um, I didn't read that book, but I know that the movie was an utter shit show and a mess. Um, so like struggling with conclusions is something we know. This, not not an issue in this series. Um, this series has a very clear, like, you can get, you get, you're like, okay, he knows where he's going when he started it. I don't know the path if he, I don't think he has a path planned from start to end, but he knows where he's ending as a writer in this book, so despite my panic of Queenslayer. And honestly, I just like, I felt panicked because I didn't know when we were actually gonna be done because there's so many conflicts throughout this whole series. And I didn't know how we were going to end with his family, especially. Um, they're a whole mess throughout this whole series, but 
in the end solid five out of five stars for like the whole series i don't know that i think i originally crown breaker was my favorite book of the series but i think now that i've read them all queen slayer might be the best book of the whole series to me they're all really good but i think queen slayer because i was literally like i got tied to it emotionally that i literally was like literally panicked like if you kill her <laughs> i will end i will rain fire then i read the empress of salt and fortune i think it's uh, by by nevo i'm sorry i'm probably pronouncing that wrong anyways wonderful read can't believe how much we we did in such a short period of time and i definitely want to pick up the um sequel to it um which has come out it's got like a tiger on the cover um coming down from there and i love the cover design of this series too definitely such a good such a good novella and i'm i think this is i think the title is the chosen and the beautiful and uh, the author has another novella coming out this year and the cover i'll put the cover here is beautiful it looks so like glamoury and like 70s like fog kind of thing so like i'm so i'm even more excited to read that now that i've read this this and i loved it so solid like five out of five stars I think was what I put and just wonderful fantasy and just read it. As someone who's been struggling an awful lot with YA fantasies I am pleasantly surprised by how much I love Sisters of Sword and Song. I genuinely really liked it. Um, I think in the end it was like a four and a half out of five stars which I think is like the first time in a while that I've really really enjoyed an, a, a YA fantasy. They all just seem very a lot of the same to me. Um, this was awesome uh the main character we find out at the beginning is like all of a sudden appears at her family home like secretly like don't tell them that i'm here and then all of a sudden her army recruit or band or whatever the heck it is shows up and is like yo she killed the general's son and you're like what she did what and then there's this whole court thing and like yeah you're guilty you're not gonna die but we're gonna put you in jail for like 15 years and she's confused because she's like i should have I should have been executed what is happening and then her sister jumps in like I'll take half of her punishment and it's this whole mystery unraveling of all of the corruption and why why this punishment happened because it should have been more severe based on their conduct code and it was just really interesting read I really liked having both of the sisters in this this was um that was I think the biggest strength of this um, I think it would have been not something I had enjoyed if we only followed like one of the sisters and then in book two followed another sister. This was perfect. It's a good standalone. Then I did a group read in the TBR and Beyond group for Fable by Adrian Young. This is another one like I have been struggling with YA fantasies. I enjoy this. I think I actually preferred this to Sky in the Deep. I think it's also probably also because I'm like on this huge like I'm forever. There's not enough like female pirates. There's not enough female pirate books out there for me to like consume to like fill the thirst that I have. So this, this is wonderful. Um, the ending is wild. Okay. It's a very abrupt ending. So I'm very thankful. I think it's in March book two. the conclusion to this comes out. This one's fable. I think book two is called namesake. I also appreciated that Wednesday books released the cover. Like before this book even came out, they had the cover for book two. So you could see that they were going to match. So I was like, okay, I will justify buying the books then that way. I know they'll match um so i uh, this was just a wild a wild read adrian young's a really good um ya writer i think she's she's been uh, she's also been very good at picking these these like the they're not widespread wide blown like overly used tropes but there's very clearly a want like with the first book sky in the deep people like lusting in ya fantasies over like vikings and female warriors and then this book with the pirates we know that there's like a cult following in so many groups that I'm in around Daughter of the Pirate King because of all of the elements of like the pirating, the badassness, the banter. And so I think this highlighted the pirateness of it. Not so much the, the banter or anything like that, but I really liked all of the characters. I liked the conflict. The father-daughter relationship is complicated for sure. Um, and that's another thing that I seem to enjoy in a lot of books as well. So I really enjoyed this. It's like a four out of five stars for me. Really enjoyed. Then I read Body Under the Piano. And as you can tell from my facial expression, my tone, I was not a big fan. I am trash, utter trash for like middle grade mysteries, kids solving shit, detectives, um, you know, just parents being oblivious to shit and just like kids being under, not underappreciated, but like people not expecting what they're capable of fully doing. I love all those elements. This book was utterly fucking boring to me. I was so mind-numbingly bored for this whole book. Whole book. 
not not nothing in it caught my eye nothing was exciting nothing <sighs> kind of annoyed because I really <laughs> I've been on such a good roll with like middle grade mysteries and liking them all but this one not so much unfortunately it's just like a I don't know, two or three out of five stars. It wasn't bad, I was just so bored. Then I picked up K-Pop Confidential by Stephen Lee. Um, this was, it's technically YA, um, but when I think of the other YA books that I read this month, this is probably, it's on the YA spectrum definitely, but I think it's closer to, I think it's closer to middle grade. It's a very simple plot and conflict is very cheesy very cheesy dramatically romantic-y kind of ending. I think it has a really good message um, but I also think it dips an awful lot into stereotypes of what k-pop is. I know there's all that thing in the west of like oh they just do slave contracts and like all they do is eat sweet potatoes and die and like the women just like are perpetually under surgical like plastic surgery and you're like and then when you actually start paying attention in k-pop you're like okay but that's a very giant stereotype there's all that one too of like they don't rent their own music but then there's like people are like cultishly fans of people like bts because they literally are so involved in their own music and like rose from blackpink is one who's like perpetually like i want to make sure the music that i put out is good quality so i'm taking my time with it so she's involved in it and like i don't know it just felt very like cheesy and like i was just expecting maybe a little bit more like delving into what exactly um is in the k-pop industry this just felt a little flat for me though i do still really really love the cover anyway so i think this the end was like a three out of five stars it's not bad but i think it was just a super super simple and plot and just like a very unrealistic-y and dramatic-y conclusion. I picked up The Bright and Breaking Sea by Chloe Neal this month too. This was so good, so good. I gave it a four out of five stars or four and a half out of five stars though because of the ridiculously unnecessary romance. It was so wildly unneeded, so ridiculously forced. It wasn't shown in any of the actions. It was just like, oh, and all of a sudden I felt like this burning with inside me. And you're like, why? why where is this coming from there was literally you, you could have literally just redacted all those things where she was like wanting to insert a romance into it and you'd be like okay they're friends that's it you didn't need anything more from that why why was this the, it was it took away from everything in this book it was so bad so unnecessary and not well written in the rest of this book which is frustrating because the rest of the book was so well written i liked the characters i liked the plot i liked the conflict i liked the world i i loved this like little girl who sneaks onto the ship and like I just loved that. And then the romance was just shoved in there. I don't know if the author wrote this book and then the editor was like, we need a romance for it to sell. And then they randomly shoved it in because that's how it felt. It just felt so disjointed and so unnecessary. It didn't fit the rest of the tone, the, the rest of everything. So I loved, I loved all the sailing and the traveling and adventuring we get to do in here. I loved the characters. I don't even hate the characters that were shoved into this romance. It's the act of the romance. It was not needed. It just, it didn't add anything. And honestly, it took me out of the book more because I was like, where is this coming from? Then on a whim, I picked up The Duke Who Didn't by Courtney Milan. This came up in, um, I think from some work book recommendation webinars that I went to. And I was like, oh, that's a fine cover. Um, it's like, I I'm not a big fan of like those dramatic, like shirtless men on covers, but it was nice to see that the character, the people on the covers weren't white for once. And I know the author is like, I've seen her name before, but I've never actually read anything by the author before. So I was just like, hmm. I just like set, got through this in like one sitting, just blew through it it was so good it was so fun it was so sweet i loved the dialogue honestly in this um the main character is her father and her got screwed over and swindled when they came to england um by um these british dudes and they stole her father's recipe and are now making a bunch of money off of it so their game plan is to save up they live in this uh uniquely diverse community where only half of the population is white and um they just like live in this wonderful and also weirdly they don't pay rent which it's this whole thing brought up 
and so she's grown up there and her and her father are trying to save money to produce a new product that they know is really good and they want to start selling it and there's this like annual fair game that people come to town for that is coming up so they want to make sure their product is ready to sell and to start launching their company for that um for that point and the main character's father is getting older and having some ill ill issues and then this boy that she's had a fling with in the back and in over the years comes back after being gone for a little while and then he shows up and you find out that he's never actually told anyone that he's like actually the owner of the entire village community land he just grew up there as a kid and no one knew it because of his weird family background and he's falling in love with this girl and now wants to offer her something but he feels like she'll be upset because she's lied to him and then there's a bit of distance because he keeps leaving abruptly for years at a time and never communicating with her so she thinks he's toying with her and this whole thing so all of these conflicts kind of intertwine and they start working together it's a pretty simple plot and conflict though in the end it's resolved fairly easily it's sweet it's cute it's fun it's got that diverse elements that I just enjoy and their backstory is really kind of picked apart as we go through the story it was really really fun I really enjoyed this highly recommend to no one's surprise I snuck in a rereading of The Curious Beginning this month because I am utter trash. We don't need to review this book again. I concluded the month by reading A Declaration on the Rights of Magicians by H.G. Perry. This is not going to be a book for everyone. I can definitely uh, attest to that um, having now read it. But I love this. I love things that whether it's alt history, historical fiction, fantasy that have heavy in politics because I just feel like it's so relevant to our world that it's so easy to draw parallels and then I I just I find it interesting so I can see if you're someone who likes fantasies but like just like the adventuring aspect of it probably not for you but if you're someone who enjoys a lot of the politics conflicts of our own world delved into and a bit of a fantasy element um then this would probably be something I, I would definitely recommend we jump through a bunch of different time periods and characters um but there's like werewolves and wizards and people are allowed to have you're only allowed to use your magic if you're at certain status levels in society and there's this whole court case of this guy who's like house gets robbed and he uses magic to defend himself and his wife and then he ends up going to jail for like a decade because he wasn't technically allowed permission even though it's fucking self-defense because he wasn't of an upper higher class and he wasn't registered and then we have uh this whole um kind of group of characters in england for the most part though they bounce back and forth between france and everything that are trying to use their power and position to get rid and the if you're thinking just trying to think of the time period um that this is during when we do still have active slave ownership um so they're trying to use their position within the government to roll back these restrictions because magic is being used to enforce slavery um so we 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 go through all these different time periods and all these different conflicts but that is one thing that i found really super interesting i was not expecting to be a focus point um but using uh these little small government adjustments um on the restraints and restrictions of magic to slowly remove the power that slave owners and transporters have to keep slaves and so it gives the slaves um, the ability to fight back and it's just this whole adjustment in the politics of England and France at the time and as you can imagine from the time period as well France is always a shit show <laughs> France no even in 2020 like France is always going to be that country as soon as their politicians fuck up they're like all right let's break out the guillotine like we're ready like that's just how they do it. <laughs> so in the end I really enjoyed the vast majority of books that I read this month uh favorites and everything I think will go least favorite probably be the body under the piano followed shortly by k-pop comp k-pop confidential I think my most surprising book of the month was probably sisters of sword and song I've just been like struggling so much with YA fantasies and um, I, I went into Fable uh, knowing that it was probably going to be good because everyone's been raving in every again kind of cultish following around like creating and popping up around Adrian Young. I can totally understand. Read it, thoroughly enjoyed it. But I just haven't heard anything about Sisters of Sword and Song. I had one friend who really liked it and told me to buy it so that's when I bought it and I never really heard anything of it since fantasy standalones are also like notoriously difficult to make really enjoyable but this book just like really uh, I it, it went above what I was expecting I was going to get so wonderfully surprised and then favorite this month again keeping in mind that I don't include rereads so a curious beginning does not 
qualify. Um, it was a bit of a toss up between um, the Duke who didn't, the, the Bright and the Breaking Sea and um, the, uh, the Goblin Emperor. Um, and then I looked, I was like, of those three, the Bright and the Breaking Sea had the unnecessary romance. So that would be the bottom of the three best. And then I was like, the Duke who didn't was fantastic. But I'm still thinking about the Goblin Emperor. Like, I don't know exactly why, but I am still thinking about that book. And honestly, if it had a, a half decent cover, I probably would have buy a physical copy of it by now at this point. It was so good. It was such a good book. I can't quite explain why, but it was just everything about it, it was like wonderful. I almost I kind of hesitate because of the, such a big word, but it's like, it's a perfect read. Like, I don't know that there's anything in that that I read and I was like, I would change this because it was all great and necessary and I, I was enjoying it but I didn't want to just inhale it in one single sitting. I wanted to take my time and like, enjoy it as I went through. Like, I don't know, I feel like it's it's amazing that I can sit down and just binge a book like The Duke Who Didn't in one sitting but I feel like it's something special that I'm like, I want to take my time with this book because it is so good. I want to draw it out because I don't know when the next time I'm going to have this feeling is. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's all the book stuff. What did I have? Uh, I was trying to do like monthly like pat on the back things. My bed got delivered in January. I am now the proud owner of a new mattress. I have never owned a new bed in my life. Um, so that happened in January. It took me 28 and a half years and an inheritance to be able to afford it. But um, I now have my own my own brand new mattress box spring frame. However, when I did buy it, I don't know that I shared this before. One of my dog is a big like 100 pound like mixture of a bunch of different things. My other dog is a little itty bitty Shih Tzu Poodle. who is about 15 pounds when he has lots of hair. And my dumbass, well, I, I don't know, I've just never done this before. I didn't think anything of it. I got my new bed installed and then he ran up to try and jump on it and face planted into the side of it because he's too little to just casually jump on the bed. So then I ran around town for like a full day to every pet store, uh, home sense, every kind of home depot-y place. And I finally at one store found dog stairs. So after spending like 16, 1800, whatever dollars, getting myself a brand new bed, I then had to go spend a hundred dollars on dog stairs. So if people are ever out here being like, dogs aren't children. Yes, they fucking are. <laughs> And I stayed on track for my food wise. I feel like I'm just, I'm not as craving at fast food as much anymore. And um, yeah. Oh, and I got through another COVID scare. Anyways, that was my January. Let me know what you read in the month of January. Um, how, what did you do in life? Successes. Um, congratulations to the United States for having a, I hesitate to say peaceful transfer of power. <sighs> Stay inside, wear a mask, stop fighting with minimum wage workers. Black Lives Matter. And I hope in February you are working on listening to Black Voices, getting recommendations from Black book reviewers. I have all of these books linked on my Goodreads account. So if you want to follow that, you can do that. Anyways, I will link all of my social media down below. If you follow me, I will follow you back unless you have a super sketchy account. 